Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here today. Um, for the second day of this Congress on the Inklings and the Western Imagination, uh, the first talk is going to be run by uh, Amaya Fernandez here. Amaya is a teacher uh, in this faculty, and, well, she's a researcher in gender and cultural studies and has recently been uh, writing on the subversion of myths and the representation of genders in both science fiction and fantasy cinema and literature, both from the US and the UK. Uh, she also worked on the University of Castilla-La Mancha, and uh, she participated in research projects on the performance of gender in reality shows and the representation uh, of the corporeal dimension of gendered identities in mainstream cinema. Uh, she's also part of the Rewest group in this faculty, and currently her interests uh, are basically uh, exploring the relationship between the myth of the Western frontier and the concept of post-humanity. So today, as you can see, she'll be talking about uh, Peter Jackson's, um, let's say, representation of The Hobbit in his filmic version. And with no more delay, I can, well, you can start whenever you want, Amaya. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And um, I, I thought it was interesting when you paused before saying, let's call it a representation of The Hobbit. I think there's been quite a din um, because um, there was a sense of betrayal uh, when many uh, diehard fans watched the trilogy. Um, and um, so, in fact, this is what is, um, I found it particularly interesting. Um, the adaptation itself, the fact that we're talking about a different text than the original text. And um, if you are at all familiar with the idea of uh, intertextuality and the theoretical approach to film adaptations, um, you will probably realize that the first point that we, I'd like to make is answering the question, is Peter Jackson to talk in what the future is to the past? And then, of course, going back to this idea of intertextuality and paratextuality and transtextuality, um, the answer should be no, a qualified no. So to begin with, a film adaptation is a new creation. The sense of betrayal, I think it's rooted in the fact that when you read, um, when readers approach a text, they do construct their own vision, they, they, they produce their own film, as it were. And of course, then watching somebody else's film, somebody else's reading of a text, in this case, Peter Jackson's, uh, usually um, highlights differences rather than the similarities between um, the imagined text uh, in your mind and the text that you are watching on a screen. And the problem is, I think, arises, and this is what the uh, debate, um, what has spurred the, the debate, I'd say, is the fact that um, we, nowadays it is almost impossible to think of such a uh, widely popular text as, uh, texts as um, Tolkien's are, um, just as individual texts and detached from everything else that's going around them. And everything, else, and everything that's been going around for decades now. So the concept of intertextuality, this was originally introduced um, by narrat um, sorry, in narrat narratology, and I'm going to quote Jeanette on this one. Um, the idea is that a text is not born um, in an aseptic context. It is born out of a long tradition of other texts, and it was created. It is created not in a vacuum, but in um, we could say it's almost like a, a network of different influences, different texts, and all these texts that went there before the the, the texts that we are dealing with in question. All these texts establish a dialogue with the newest, the um, latest text. So intertextuality is this idea that uh, all texts are connected somehow in the same way that all humans are connected through collective identities, through um, uh, cultural references, cultural, um, um, the, 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 um, what can we, we could call it like the, as the, uh, yes, the background, I call it the background, that, um, or the fertile soil, if you like, um, that uh, out of which everyone and everything that is uh, human-made um, rises. So 
Um, but then there is something else. We can also go beyond the verbal text, the, the literary text. So if, if on the one hand we have these, this network of connectivity um, that connects, as it were, ties together, bonds together, all these literary texts, on the same hand, uh, at the same time, we do have um, also uh, a, connect, a connection with texts that are non-verbal, not literary. So culture as um, a network um, embraces, comprehends a lot more than simply uh, what is literary and what is uh, verbal. Therefore, we need to also take into account everything that uh, surrounds a literary text um, in, in, in this case, very appropriately. We can think of film adaptations, but there is also merchandising, there are also posters, there is um, artwork based on uh, Tolkien's novels. I don't, I don't think I need to draw you a picture. You have uh, probably come across l plenty of um, paintings, portraits, uh, figurines, um, even soundtracks, music that is, has been inspired or somehow has a connection with Tolkien's uh, works. And then, of course, there is also the idea of hypertextuality when texts um, um, not only in, um, conceive each other and are sort of embedded in each other, and we have this idea of metatextuality working um, behind uh, the scenes, as it were, but also the idea that we can go beyond a text and create um, sort of um, um, uh, parallel realities that are different and they are separate and at the same time they are connected. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is that even though some of us, many of us, perhaps don't like really the idea, I'm going to um, paraphrase Roland Barthes here. It's not just the author that is dead, um, not only the modern subject that is dead, but I think also the text. I should probably have written this with a capital T because it is the text as the ultimate source, the definite version of something that uh, is dead. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to frame um, texts w within the context that in which, uh, to which they belong. And also, we need to, I think, um, put aside what may be a personal uh, approach to the text. We know now in post-modern post times that there are as many texts as readers, basically. This is one of the uh, most important axes of post-modern and post-postmodern readings um, of literature and texts in general. So if we... Um, approach a text, address a text, um, and uh, establish an ongoing dialogue with that text that forbades everything else, every, every other possible reading of the text. We are basically going back, backwards in time, and we are denying these paratextual, intertextual, transtextual reality that I think uh, shouldn't be denied at all. So then there is something else that's going on. So we have a fictional text, literary work, uh, that now has become virtual. So um, these unrealities, the fictional, uh, that has now spilled over into the internet um, and has been debated endlessly and is still being talked about in forums. So we do have fanfic, of course, fan fiction but we also have simple conversations and um, WhatsApp uh, texts being sent back and forth between um, viewers of, um, excuse me, viewers of um, Peter Jackson's trilogy and readers and, and uh, readers of, of um, Tolkien's texts. So we do have to expand this idea of fictionality into something that is virtual. It's not tangible but it's still textual, it's still verbal for the most part. Sometimes it's pictorial, it's uh, images, as I said, I've mentioned artwork uh, being published and uh, also being spread through the internet, uh, drawings and uh, different versions of the uh, Tolkien's characters being uh, represented, presented again um, by fans through the artwork. Um, so in, in these... Mm, very complex and multi-layered world, there is also something else that need, needs to be taken into account. And I think this is 
what really angered, um, because there was a lot of anger. I, I was aware of a sense of outrage um, when uh, the trilogy, J Jackson's trilogy, was first launched, particularly the first text, which was the most surprising. Uh, I believe, being the first one. So I think that at the heart of the, all this anger, there was a sense of commodification of Tolkien's uh, The Hobbit. Um, it was commercialized, and it was turned into um, a money-making uh, venture, enterprise. Um, this is something that, of course, if you have an idealized and uh, perhaps emotional attachment to Tolkien's text, might be the cause, the source for um, disappointment, if not worse. Um, so one of the first things that um, caught my eye when I watched the film, when I saw the film in the cinema for the first time, it was the fact that I remembered parts of the film, and it was the first time I, I, I had seen it. I remembered them because I'd played the game, and there were sequences that were uh, taken exactly um, from the game, the video game. Uh, I don't remember now which one of the games, the, but I think it was the, the classic Lord of the Rings video game, the first one. Um, and so the sequence, if you remember, um, from the ending of the first, uh, of the first film, of the first um, part of the trilogy, uh, the sequence in which the uh, the company of dwarves is escaping the dungeons of the elven king, um, and they are then jumping from barrel. There's Legolas jumping from barrel to barrel, and they are just going downwards uh, with the current um, in in these barrels. Um, that is a sequence that I, I played that I remembered being Legolas and jumping and, and learning the trick of jumping from barrel to barrel. So. This text had already been written in part. The script was already there. It was not, um, again, this was not just an adaptation of Tolkien's original novel. This was an adaptation of a video game, which I found a bit disturbing, perhaps, because it was the first time. So this is my emotional experience of the text, of course. Um, but what is really interesting, if we look at this from the perspective of film adaptation studies, is the paratextuality, the fact that we have parallel dimensions that, are, that go beyond the literary, that go beyond even the filmic, and that are part uh, of the experience. Uh, for some people, there will be no, there's no going back. Um, many people born in this century will have never experienced the, will not experience talking's text uh, alone. Um, they will first watch the, um, the films or have, they might have seen glimpses um, of, this, of the films, or maybe have seen figurines, or, um, as I said, played the game. So the experience has changed, has been altered. And this is something that we need to, to face, this new reality or unreality of um, the, the, the experience of the literature as a more than just literature. Um, but, and this is my focal point, and I'm getting there in a second, um, what also struck me was the fact that I saw a sexualization of um, more than one character, I'd say, but in particular, Keeley. Um, hence my, the title of, these, of, these, um, of my speech, um, Keeley is hot, um, and which is quite, was quite surprising because, of course, my memory of the novel, of the 13 Dwarves, uh, was anything but a sexual one, a sexualized one, when I, when I read Tolkien's novel uh, in my teens. So we do have, we do see a representation of um, a few of the characters, not all of them, of course, but a few that are sexualized as to, so as to represent these sexual desire as a communal experience to talk to, to enlarge, as it were, the audience, the, the target audience for the film. So in, in pure uh, Hollywood style, sex becomes, is part of this um, commodification process. And it's a shared experience that can be um, understood by, by many more people than just the pleasure of reading fantasy, a fantasy um, text. Something else that was also interesting, I found, was that the choice of the sexual um, focal point, somebody who is not 
from a human race. If you remember in The Lord of the Rings, one of the main uh, characters, Aragorn, um, had been obviously chosen also because of his appearance. He was regal enough, but also handsome enough to be the leading role. There were others, Legolas, the elf, of course, just comes to mind, but um, the... Uh, the beautiful people, the handsome people, were definitely human-looking. And there was not so much emphasis on the, the race, um, in quotation marks, the race or the species of these, um, of these characters when it came to just making them a spectacle uh, for the benefit of the viewer's eyes. In this case, though, the Achille is a dwarf, and um, the way in which the second and the third films in particular are developed, the, the way that the plot develops, um, the fact that we have an interspecies relationship is something central and um, has been made into one of the um, most salient, I'd say, features uh, in Jackson's texts. So it is now, one of the things that I thought was being attempted was making it politically correct an interspecies sexual and romantic relationship. When I say sexual, of course, there is no consummation, but the implications are there, as we're going to see in a second. And then the third point, um, I obviously was very aware of the fact that we, again, we had a female character, Toriel, that was not in the original text, and that was uh, there to include some femaleness into Tolkien's text, to insert some more... A more, more of a presence for women, because as we all know, it was it is practically absent. There are no female characters, with a few exceptions. Something someone who's mentioned maybe uh, there are references, but there is no uh, female character, not central, not even secondary in in Tolkien's The Hobbit. Things change a little bit, of course, in the the Lord of, um, of the Rings, uh, but again, Jackson did try to give um, a few female characters even more prominence than they had in the original texts. Arwen, of course, is the uh, most obvious example of this. Uh, but in this case, I think that um, gender equality, as in the um, a rewriting of gender roles and expectations, was one of the um, most... It was, it was something done deliberately by Jackson. It, it was something that was scripted um, voluntarily scripted into the films by Jackson. And I keep talking about Peter Jackson as if he were the only author of um, this trilogy. Of course, he signed his name, um, but we must be aware of the fact that there are, there's a whole team of people behind uh, a trilogy of such scale. Um, okay, so now for the main topic, the main point... So the first thing, we, I, I, I think I can argue that we have, we can see an attempt at regenderizing sexual desire. When I say regenderizing, I mean that um, traditionally, historically in Western culture, the object of sexual desire in art has been female, and then the author or the subject of the gaze has been male, and heterosexual at that, of course. Um, in this case, the gender expectations had been inverted um, to some extent. So we are re-genderizing. We're genderizing again sexual desire. There is gender in it. It is not neutral. It does not go beyond or escape gender. And a binary gender at that, a binary um, mm, um, system when it comes to that. But there is at least an attempt... Um, at doing things in such a way that expectations are inverted, to say the very least. So in this case, the male object of female desire is... Sorry, we have a male object of, I'd say, female desire. Of course, um, should it be female? We don't really know. Uh, it is a male object of desire. So the, the object of desire is male. So far, so good. Now, the gaze, who is... Who's the gaze? Uh, we don't really... We can't really decide that. There can be expectations, but we cannot to decide that. Do you think I could have your mobile phone closer so I can... Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. That's right. <coughs> okay, so the first point, of course, I don't need to go into this uh, any further. Um, 
sex as a voyeuristic, so watching a film as a voyeuristic experience, it is something that is being done again and again in Hollywood, in, in more mainstream cinema. So I don't think I need to explain this. Um, and the, what is, it is not even a novelty anymore to have um, a male character or a male body um, made into a spectacle. Uh, but the fact that this is an explicit genderization um, is linked with the next point, which is the not so explicit genderization of the viewer, which I also find interesting, particularly because I've been watching these films, I've been reading these films also um, within the framework from the perspective of audience reception theory studies. So we do have, uh, of course, heterosexual females who might be interested in um, these male spectacle of a body. Um, but also bisexual females, and of course also homosexual and bisexual males, and everybody else. So there is really no telling who the viewer might be. And I think this breaks also um, many more um, expectations, breaks through other many more expectations than simply the expectation of having a female object of desire. Um, so it is, the, the viewer is ungendered, except if we look at the um, dynamic between viewer and, and viewed object um, uh, in, in a very stereotypical, through a very stereotypical identification of gender, physical sex, and sexual orientation. If we do look at things in this binary way um, and simply um, associate one sex to one gender, one sexual orientation with one gender, then of course we will create a, a assumptions hmm, when it comes to the viewer's um, identity, identity as well. Okay, so I've mentioned this already. I'm very interested in what the reception of the films were, the trilogy, hmm, rather than in deciding to what extent it was faithful to the original text, it was not in many senses, um, in, in more than one way, of course. I don't need to, again, explain in detail all the, the ways in which the, uh, Jackson's versions of The Hobbit departed from the original text. Uh, but I am interested in seeing what the reception might have been and what the reactions were. Starting from the point, my personal experience of being surrounded by very angry people <laughs> um, and then uh, looking into the internet for more reactions and more views, more readings of the text. So this was one of the, um, it, it was read by quite a, a large number of people, hollywood.com. The name of the website should already tell you from what perspective this was uh, read. So it was a mainstream reading of Jackson's trilogy. Um, this is Abby Stone uh, commenting on um, The Hobbit. And while Bilbo is brave and Thorin strong, it is Skilly, oh, Killy, who acts as the Hobbit's eye candy. As once happened with Orlando Bloom's Legolas, it is Skilly who will prompt teenagers to ask, is it okay that I am like obsessed with a mythological being? To which we all answer, yes, yes it is, because God damn it, Killy is one hot dwarf. Um, and this is the eye candy. So, of course, if the term eye candy had been associated with a female um, character and, and, and an actress, um, things might have been a bit different. Uh, one might have asked, how is it even possible to have such a reification um, of a character and the real person behind the character? But this is an inversion of roles that is still playing around with this idea that it's sort of okay to invert things to subvert expectations, and it's not that bad to call a man, to reduce a man as um, to eye candy. Um, the premise, of course, is that Tolkien's 13 goblins possess very few identifying traits. We only have a few identifying traits for, uh, I, I, I counted four main, uh, I should say probably five, um, hobbits, sorry, dwarfs, bomber, Fat, that is his number one uh, identifying trait, and he mostly thinks about eating. Of course, it is connected with the first one, which makes it a more comical character, even though, of course, we do all know that the Hobbit has a more humorous tone uh, when it, if compared to the Lord of the Rings. So in general, things are more lighthearted to some extent. Um, and what is also interesting is the fact that Bomba keeps on complaining um, about being treated uh, unfairly uh, because of his size. 
Um, then we have Thorin, regal, the heir to the throne, uh, proud, stubborn, to the point of almost losing or actually losing his mind. Um, it is represented more subtly, perhaps, in, in uh, Jackson's version, but he will eventually succumb to the sin of greed towards the end, although he redeems himself, um, as in the film. Then we have Dwalin, kind, takes pity on Bilbo more than once, and he carries him on his back. Well, m uh, more dwarves do the same thing, but then Dwalin is the first one. He, um, well, he saves Bilbo's life on more than one occasion. And then we have Philly and Killy, and the only things we know about Philly and Killy is uh, that they are Thorin's nephews, they are the youngest of the company of 13 dwarves, and then they have the finest sight, eyesight, and therefore they are usually used to scout ahead and see if danger might be near. Um, and they are also good warriors, and they do die um, by uh, Thorin's side um, in the last battle. Um, but other than that, that's all we know. So what is interesting also is the way in which Peter Jackson had to reinvent and to create a face, a body, had to embody these characters. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, this is yet another take on um, the, the, the physical representation of the hobbits, um, again, of the dwarves in the Hobbit. Trilogy. There are plenty of reasons to be excited about Peter Jackson's new talking trilogy. Let's ignore all of that and talk about the Hobbit's dwarf eye candy. Yet again, same expression. This time on BuzzFeed.com, we have this um, article in which a Louis Pitzman ranks the dwarves in terms of their hotness. Surprisingly, but this was actually... Uh, written before the, the launch, so only the trailer was available. Um, the first film in the trilogy had not been launched yet. So he decides to have Philly um, as number one in, these, uh, in, 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 in terms of hotness. Uh, but this is a personal take. So then we have everybody else in the company listed uh, from the most, the hottest to the least hot. Um, so Philly, Dean O'Gorman, what I'd like you to see in this, um, to look for um, in these images, is the fact that we have um, changes. I've been, so the, the nose is slightly bigger, and of course the hairstyle and then um, um, facial hair has become pre um, prominent in the, um, the way this character has been um, portrayed. Um, then we have um, Killy. Um, very, I mean, nothing has changed really. In terms of the, the makeup, um, the eyebrows are still the same, his own uh, beard, uh, yes, longer hair, but it is a hairstyle that is m less dramatic than this one with all the little uh, braids. And then the styles become more and more dramatic and the characters um, different from the original, uh, the, the actor's own um, appearance. So all of these images have been taken by, uh, from the, the official website of The Hobbit or the uh, actor's own official website. Um, so this is how they present themselves and then how they are represented in the film and uh, made into characters. Now, Thorin, um, still quite similar to his own, so still sticks to some extent to this original appearance of the actor, but the nose has been changed, it's much bigger. Um, uh, the beard also is slightly longer, but still really well groomed, and the eyebrows. This seems to be one of the, the feature. If you are a dwarf, you have to have big eyebrows, except Killy does not have big eyebrows, so that's significant, isn't it? Um, okay, and then things become more and more grotesque uh, as we proceed downwards. Um, so Ori, of course, uh, there is nothing sexy in a canonical way. It was made to look ridiculous. It was made to look funny, um, perhaps a little bit naive, uh, but um, there is also something monkish about him that just puts um, aside any, any indication of him being sexualized at all. And so on and so forth, more and more grotesque. Um, the, the hairstyles are just exaggerated. There's an excess of facial hair. hair. 
Um, and um, of course, also the age of the dwarfs increases uh, towards the, um, the bottom part of the list. Uh, this dwarf even has um, an axe of some sort stuck into his forehead. So not a classic traditional sa uh, sign of sexiness. Um, and then, of course, Bomba, who is still fat, uh, exaggerated, nothing to do with, yes, the, the actor has a round face, but there's nothing, um, nothing compares to Bomba's excess of flesh. And Balin, um, old and wise, but also ridiculous in his, from a Western point of view, from the point of view of nowadays um, um, real world cosmetic aesthetic rules of course. Um, so the point is that this is the most human-like dwarf of them all. And of course, because the viewer is human, has to be the sexist. Um, and he has been chosen to be the only one that has an explicit love relationship in the story. So I thought originally that we were re-genderizing sexual desire, but um, I think we're just genderizing it again according to the same set of rules. Nothing much seems to have changed. In fact, if you look at this, this is from the first film, long before he meets Toriel, um, this is him being represented as a uh, easily... Um, fl He's flirting with this elf girl he's never seen before. So um, what then will happen with Toriel, it is not uh, as if it were something exceptional, him falling in love with, a, uh, with an elf. In fact, this is um, Dwalin's face because he accuses him of liking elf girls, uh, to which he answers, oh no, they have too, um, uh, too little facial hair for my taste. Again, this is playing with the stereotype that dwarf women have... Uh, beards, just the same as the man, uh, the, the, the male dwarfs, I mean. And, of course, then um, there is this joke because he is looking at this other elf and he turns out to be a male elf. But because of the androgynous features, the plays around, oh, oh, Kelly, you are wrong because you are heterosexual and you are attracted now uh, by uh, a, a, a boy, a, a male elf. So, ha, ha, um, laughter ensues. Of course. Um, but then, if you were in doubt, if you were just uh, not uh, perhaps convinced that there is a, a, an explicit sexualization of Kelly as a character, uh, this is one of the lines, this is when he has actually met Tutorial. And uh, so, aren't you going to search me? I could have anything down my trousers or nothing, replies Toriel. And this was one of the most, perhaps, uh, this was breaking a taboo. There is a, an explicit sexual. Um, reference in a text based on talking. So the context, I think, is so obvious I don't need to go further into that. The point is that, uh, and again, we are looking back at this genderization um, from a standard, uh, patriarchal, classical, traditional point of view. And uh, from ancient Greece onwards, we, there seems to be this law that can be subverted at times, but it seems to be a law. Kalos kaya agathos, meaning um, that if you are beautiful, you must be good, and if you are good, you must be beautiful. Sometimes, as I said, this might be um, uh, this law might be broken, but it is something done deliberately, and it's very obvious whenever this law is broken. So, in this particular case, the company of the thirteen dwarves, um, many of them are not considered, cannot be considered canonically uh, beautiful, handsome, but they are really funny, and they are grotesque in a way that. Um, is comic. Therefore, they are forgiven their ugliness. So ugliness can be a feature on your side if you are going to be uh, adding to the comicity, uh, to the comic uh, tone of a text. Then, if we're looking at the, um, how handsome and how good characters are, um, then we see that we have plenty of undignified, not handsome characters who are actually good, uh, but again, the comicity, the, the fact that they are comical looking is uh, highlighted. And we also have the, the reverse. So this is a very grotesque to the point of being disgusting 
um, uh, character, mm, looks sickly, um, has um, a cancerous look to his skin, so he's very repulsive. Uh, but he's, this repulsiveness is undignified and yet turned into something comical, the way he dances around and prances and um, uh, he's, he's um, double chin, if it may call, be called that, he's uh, just swinging um, uh, to and fro. That is just adding to the fact that this is not a dignified uh, sort of ugliness nor evilness. And then, of course, you have those who are dignified and good, and you can just tell that they are given a much more handsome look. Uh, Gandalf, as an old man, would be the exception to this, but again, his um, signature style, he is meant to be dignified and pleasant, certainly not repulsive at all. And then, of course, and this is surprising, I think, because this is the least repulsive of the evil characters that I've seen uh, in any of Peter Jackson's film. I don't think he was meant to be completely repulsive as the Goblin King was. So you can see here that there is definitely this masculine look, and even though there are some animal features to this uh, skull, the bone structure is not meant to be one that could create um, uh, such disgust and such, such repulsion. Such repulsion. Um, and even the way in which the figurines and merchandising was then uh, marketed, and, and so this is a commanding gesture that Borg has here, and these cannot but remind us of uh, some heroes from the 1980s, um, for instance, Conan the Barbarian, the Barbarian myth, which was a sexualized myth in the 1980s. So let's go into this subversion of sexual desire. There is very little skin shown in the whole film. So when I say that something is sexualized, it is not as obvious as having somebody just um, undressing for the benefit of the viewer. Um, but the skin, the, the very little skin we see here is on these exaggerated, hyper-masculinized bodies of the two uh, main antagonists, um, Azog and his do uh, son, uh, Balk. So th the only other scene in which we see somebody naked from afar, you can hardly tell, these are the dwarves bathing in Rivendell, but there's hardly anything you can see, certainly um, not skin really being shown. Uh, but here again, they are, the, the, the armor is um, constructed in such a way that it is basically built into and onto the skin, therefore leaving the body um, open to the viewer. Um, if there's another thing I think it's interesting that for the first time we see white, the pale horse, uh, horse, sorry, uh, the pale orcs, um, they are not called whites. And I think because of the racial implications, people would not, again, from a perception theory point of view, looking at what the viewers' uh, reaction was, um, people saw a really ethnic representation of the uruk -hai in uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. They are literally black-skinned, and the, um, the way in which the features and, and the hairstyle was, um, was presented seemed to be ethnicized to a point that was rather uncomfortable um, for some viewers. So we now have pale, bad guys, um, still extremely masculine. And um, these, what is also interesting, I would like you to draw your attention to the cock piece here. And if you look at this, uh, it might seem um, like a weird choice, perhaps appropriate, but I do think it's deliberate. And the idea is that we have this association between the sexual side of orcs and death. Um, if we look at this, again, something else that makes um, these a subversion of sexual desire, like an inversion and a subversion. Um, it, sorry. Hello. Could you please? Yes. If you look at this, he's licking his lips in a, a very suggestive way, I'd say. And this is not something that is needed from the point of view of plot, and it's never happened. So he takes his time to savor this moment in which he has this attractive female uh, elf in his hands, and he does not do the same with any other character. If you look at this, uh, his arm of choice, um, weapon of choice, I should say, in his arm is this rather phallic, um, hammer, stake, all rolled into one, and visually what it's pointing out again is uh, towards his crotch. This happens again and again. The, the way the image, uh, every time Bolga is uh, being shown, we do seem to have, um, it's not 
extremely obvious, but it is there, uh, the suggestion that the uh, sight, eyesight of the viewer should be drawn towards his crotch. Um, so if we now look at maleness, the fact that the masculinity in this um, rather classic way has been presented is one as in association with maleness. So I'm not sure to what extent uh, maleness, the fact of being male, has been presented again as something new. I should say perhaps it's rather the classical way. So um, to begin with, the generalization of species in talking is something that I think has been um, respected in Jackson's version. And we do seem to have an all male um, or all masculine uh, species of dwarfs. The elves are androgynous and the orcs are again all male and rather masculine in a traditional patriarchal sense, even though they are more animalistic than, than the other species. And um, so this persists in Jackson. And however, the way he focuses on uniqueness and personality might have broken through this homogenous uh, representation of masculinity. And it does to some extent, but again, it is done in such a subtle way that it might be missed. Um, so maleness is mainly... A, associated with masculinity, and masculinity is, okay. Um, it's again composed of the same traits that one would expect um, out of a heroic epic tale. Leadership and loyalty, and so we have either fidelity to hierarchy, uh, if you are an underling, or you are a leading male, um, the leader of the pack, the alpha male. Um, there are some independent um, male characters, Legolas is one of them, and to some extent Bilbo is. Um, he takes his initiative, he is not bound to the same great level of loyalty to Thorin as the other dwarves are, and therefore he actually has some, um, there's room for creativity in, in his character. But again, even though they might be um, independent from a hierarchy, that independence is shown as one of the features that um, brand them as good, noble, and therefore um, masculine in, in the classical sense that there is a... Um, um, competitiveness and, and um, strength and courage, of course, is the next point. Either because you are fearless in, fearless in battle, which is something that applies to both bad and good characters, male characters. Um, the aggressiveness that can be found, again, in on, on yes both sides of the medal, um, of the moral compass, good and bad. Being mission-driven, um, because of um, material ambitions, that's Thorin's case. He wants, well, he does have an idealized desire to um, uh, own again the, the land, the, 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 the halls of, of his forefathers, but again, there is also uh, money and gold uh, as being one of the, the main goals of his mission. Or it could be an immaterial goal, and this is something that happens when we look, for instance, at um, Legolas's pursuit of the orcs. He does that partially, in, in part, to prove himself um, that he is not just his father's son, but also to prove to Toriel that he is uh, perhaps worthy of her love. And coolness is the other uh, element. So the disregard for ma ma manners and for personal looks, again, to some extent, we can look at this scene here. I think it, it's very telling. Um, a very, very stereotypified um, representation of your, uh, yes, the uncouthness of the true man, uh, quotation marks. The exception, of course, are the elves, but the elves, again, are mocked more than once because of their refinement, which makes them too feminine. Um, so, in fact, if we look at the level of how, how well-groomed characters are, um, it is something that is associated with class, as in uh, hierarchy, social hierarchization. Um, and this is a character that is the, perhaps the most well-groomed male character, and he is definitely androgynous and arrogant um, it, to a point, to a fault. In fact, it reminded me to some extent, um, forgive me, but I think it, it bears some resemblance with um, David Bowie's uh, character in Labyrinth. And then again, we have again a mockery of male um, uh, appearance. Pr to take pride into your one, in your appearance is something that is mocked. Again, this is one a very negative character, um, and he. This is how he actually looks, and his 
rather disheveled if you compare it with his own idealized version of himself. This is a portrait that he has in his own home. And um, then this is Thorin's uh, grandfather, and um, he is very extremely well-groomed, I'd say. There is an excess, though, that is not acceptable. Um, for a male to be appropriately dressed and groomed, there has to be uh, a lot less peacocking, uh, as it were, if you, um, if you know what I mean. In fact, he, despite the splendor of the armor, the hairstyle and the beer are missing here. Um, if you look at this, I was reminded, uh, if you look at Thorin's uh, characterization, I was reminded of Aragon. Uh, in terms of what the, the style and the beauty canon, um, the rules, and w which also took me to Aragon's other side. So this is the Aragon and this would be Strider, the two, hand, the two sides of this character. And again, uh, I think it was, it's rather obvious that there is th the same aesthetic rules apply when uh, sexualizing in turning Keeley into an object of sexual desire from the viewer's point of view. So if you look at expectations about gender, um, most for the most part, this not, doesn't seem to have been, I'm, I'm concluding, <laughs> I'm on my way uh, there. So um, the emphasis again is on being a warrior. Um, and on loyalty and honor and a willing heart, a chivalrous medieval feudal w vision of uh, masculinity on the one hand, confirmed by the fact that Dwalin says this is no place for gentlefolk. So this is a, perhaps a more Western American uh, view of um, to, to balance out for the feudal aristocratic understanding of masculinity. Uh, gentlefolk uh, are not the bourgeois, middle class, um, living room style of masculinity um, is, has to mm, be rubbed off some of the main characters for them to become um, truly heroic and truly um, accepted and as positive characters. Uh, but then Galdorf again, and this is when Jackson is trying to, be, to go back to, uh, I think, what talking spirit was, um, to have chosen somebody who's small physically because true masculinity and true valor and to, to braveness does not dwell in ma the muscles and the size of a body, but in the size of a heart. Um, and uh, so we do have, in this case, a male dwarf in distress because it is Toriel, the, the elf that saves or tries to save um, this dwarf, Kili, more than once. We do have Toriel, this uh, female elven warrior, as the knight in shiny armor. Um, and we do have a brave old lady from Lake Town, Lake, Ta Lake City, um, that actually is represented um, as a bit of odd, of an odd lady, but then eventually she is braver than uh, a few other male characters. In particular, uh, we do have Bart's children being represented. Uh, we have the two girls, even though one is taller than the boy, um, the, the daughter is taller than, than Bart's son, um, and she looks older. It is to his son that Bard um, uh, gives his sword with um, the injunction to defend and, and protect um, his, um, his um, sisters. And we have Bard, the leader, again and again mentioning, I think it's mentioned three times, um, the phrase, women and children first. Women and children and the sick will be led to some safe place uh, within Dell. Again, so this association of womanhood with weakness and feebleness and childishness. Um, and then, of course, this is probably the most, so the, the, the um, contrast to the brave old lady in Lake City is this cowardly transvestite male, uh, a weasel of a man, and of course he has to be humiliated. And I say, of course, because this has been done uh, many times in, in Western uh, cinema and literature as well, the comic drag act, and you can see that um, he is not just uh, dressing up as a woman um, in order to escape and being spared um, the battle, but be also because he wants to um, escape with uh, quite a lot of money. So greed and uh, dishonor and being cowardly as represented as a, a transvestite for femininity, which I think is it's definitely interesting. So. For the last part, even though there are definitely sexual, explicit sexual references, um, in the end, love triumphs over sex, and we have a very romanticized version, um, representation of Kili, um, and also of other couples, 
um, this might be another one, which is surprisingly has been suggested again by the audiences in forums that this might be a love affair indeed, um, a subtle one. Uh, but I agree that because of the uh, juxtaposition of the scene in which um, Galadriel is cradling Gandalf in her arms and then the same scene with the other couple, one being Kili and Toriel, uh, after Kili's death, Toriel is bending over, leaning over his corpse and kissing him. And then we have at the same time, parallel chronologically at the same time, the scene in which uh, Bilbo is, is um, holding, um, sorry, holding um, Thorin in his arms when he dies. So we have these three couples, and this is the, the, the point. So love is an, at the heart of the whole thing. Uh, it's true courage is not about killing, it is about forgiving, it is about the ordinary fo uh, folk uh, doing these uh, small deeds of kindness and love. So the centrality of love. Um, there is no sexual sexualization that is explicitly drawn to the body. It's all about the countenance of Toriel. So the female body in this sense is not up front and central. The only body that is up front and central is that the male body of uh, Azog, the orc, the defiler. And then, of course, uh, we have this, this very explicit mentioning of love. This means I love in the, the dwarf tongue. This is a platonic triangle. Um, and if we look at the platonic uh, configuration of the relationship between these characters, it is uh, almost impossible not to be reminded of the very unsexual uh, relationship, the very spiritual relationship between uh, Aragon and um, Arwen, which is then consummated in this subli sublime scene to the end when they are um, all dressed in white. And yes, it's the moment of consummation and it is sort of sexualized, but in a very subtle way. And it's beautiful because they are going to be married, so it is sanctioned. Um, so love triumphs over uh, sex in both, um, sorry, in, in Jackson's um, version of the films, which makes it a lot more palatable, I think, to uh, diehard fans of Tolkien, because in Tolkien there is no sex. Um, but um, if we look at other sublimated um, relationships, uh, again, and from the point of view of uh, audience reception, many viewers have seemed to find something that, is go that goes beyond friendship in Gimli's and Legolas' relationship, the way it's portrayed in Jackson's The Lord of the Rings, of course. This might, it is arguable, it is not, it is acceptable to be debated, but again, the many scenes in which there was physical contact and uh, affection, the way it was portrayed seems to be less subtle and mm, more um, prone to be debated by the audience. In fact, there is a lot of art um, of fan fiction that is basically verging on the pornographic, I found. And you have, this is uh, just a link to an article uh, that talks about the exquisite gayness of Sam and Frodo. This is not something that is represented um, explicitly. So again, it is arguable and it depends on the point of view of the viewer, but I find it interesting. If you look at this this way, then, um, and this is not just me, this has been again debated in forums in the internet, there seems to be some sort of sexual tension or a very, very strong bond that might uh, be verging on love between Thorin and Bilbo. And, um, this is the parallel scene that I was mentioning. And while this is explicitly heterosexually mentioned as love, um, this is not. But then remember how uh, Bilbo chokes when he is asked uh, to define his relationship with Thorin, when he says, Thorin will never be a king, what he was to you, Balin, and the rest of the dwarves. To me, he was just my, and he chokes on the word, and only towards the end, when he's back in the, in the Shire, he says the word, he settles, I'd say, perhaps, after a short pause with the full of word, friend. But the way it is, but again, it, it is um, ambiguous, I'd say. I'd concede that there is ambiguity about it. So is it hot or not to sexualize Killy? Um, while sex in talking is the ultimate taboo for many diehard fans, and ultimately, I'd say it's either non-existent or irrelevant uh, in Hollywood, it is up front and center, it is required, because not just uh, of the, the, the need to reproduce what's, what's already out there in society, but also to produce um, what uh, society might be expected to consume, and therefore it is monetized. Um, at the end, 
uh, of my reading, I have to say that there is no um, uh, there is no balance really between gender equality and such sexual objectification and political correctness. Uh, hard as as, as Mike Peter Jackson might have uh, striven to try and find a balance and give give us a bit of everything, I think because it is a bit of everything, there is basically. Uh, a failure if the original intention was that of giving, giving us a new version of masculine dwarfness. Um, romanticizing him is much more present in Tolkien and therefore it is much more palatable, as I said. Yet platonic non-consummated love is the non-heterosexual um, interspecies and perhaps intergenerational. I say intergenerational, I'm thinking of Galadriel and, um, and Gandalf, even though they're both immortal, so no generations, but one body is old and the other is youthful and beautiful in the way it is portrayed. So again, um, if, if there is an intimation of something going on between them, it might be another taboo being broken, um, the old with the young. Um, so conclusions, I'm done. Masculinity, still mainly associated with being male, Departure from that identification is portrayed negatively. The weaselly uh, comic drag act of the um, uh, ambitious bureaucrat. The opposite, Toriel, she is very masculine in, in according to all the traits that I've listed, and yet she's very attractive to a heterosexual man, um, male, I should say. Therefore, her masculinity of behavior does not detract from her femaleness um, of her body. Uh, masculine traits traits such as physical courage and single-mindedness do not detract from, that's what I just mentioned. Few alternatives to a normative masculinity are to be found, and they, have, they are subtle enough to be ambiguous and therefore arguable, but also debatable at the same time. Jackson's films are far from being politically correct because of the issues of race, class as well, again, the, 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 this idea of uh, a feudal past, but then it is also deconstructed by some of the um, uh, dialogues in the film. And yet, and this is, um, because this is work in process, this is where I would be looking into in the future, they are indicative, I think, of some changes in the audience's expectations in regards to male-female roles, to the point that simply using the same characters with the same roles as where used in Tolkien, um, by Tolkien, I should say, sorry, um, have been, I think, considered as not completely satisfactory when it comes to the public's expectations. That is my final conclusion, I'd say. So thank you very much. I'm sorry it's taken me quite some time. Oh, yes. <laughs> One hour. <laughs>